I was gonna rip his heart out, I'm the best ever I'm the most brutal and vicious and most ruthless champion that's ever been There's no one can stop me, Lynx is a conqueror No, I'm Alexander, he's no Alexander I'm the best ever, there's never been anybody ruthless I'm Sonny Liston, I'm Jack Dempsey, there's no one like me I'm from their club, there's no one that can match me My style is impetuous, my defense is impregnable And I'm just ferocious, I want your heart, I wanna eat his children Praise be to Allah Welcome back to the Bat the Ropes podcast here on Keep It Real Boxing. I am your host, Cypherbox, and let's get into it. So where should I start today? Well, let's get started with Jamel Charlo's response to Terence Crawford. Now, a few weeks ago, I did, and I did report on this, a few weeks ago, Terence Crawford came out publicly and said that if he could not get the winner of Enroll Spence Jr. and Ugas, that he was willing to go up to 154 pounds and fight the winner of Charlo versus Castanano. Okay. And this was Jamel Charlo's response on Brian Custer's The Last Stand podcast. Here it is. How about he do his best and go fight Earl Spence then? Shut up, take a little bit less money, be quiet, humble yourself, and fight Earl Spence a stud. Do what he say, and then you might be the challenger sometime. These people don't know how to do that. They don't know how to be the challenger. That's his problem. He think he's too high up on the horse. Bob Barrow don't give a damn about him. Bob Barrow told him to his face. He didn't got lawsuits with his own promoter. You ain't worth shit to me, for real. That mean the man didn't really care about you anyway. You should to just shut up, make the right decision with your real, with your people that love you, and then and then do what you gotta do. Like it's not my fault that you can't. Hey, they got some studs. So Al Heyman only gonna sign the best of the best to me first. You got Ennis, you got Garcia, you got Thurman, you got people making a name for themselves in your own way division. Sit your ass in your way division and see if you can beat one of them. Cause fucking with me, you gonna get knocked the fuck out. I'm a knockout artist, baby. I ain't here to play no games and make. I don't get paid for overtime. This is what I love about boxing. You have plenty of characters and, you know, Jamal Charlo, you know, a lot of people don't like him, you know, I don't mind him at all. You know, it's quite animated. He's entertaining in that sense. But I found it a little bit weird what he was, his response. Okay. I would, you know, even though he said that, you know, if you come and step to me, you know, I'm going to knock you out basically at the end there. There was a lot he spoke about in terms of what Terence Crawford should do. And I get his point. I'm not disagreeing with some of the things he's saying that, you know, Terence could go and fight the other welterweights, clear out his own division. Don't be messing with me. Don't step into my world and all that sort of stuff. Deal with your business where you're at at the moment in your own division. OK. Now, we know Terence Crawford right now isn't tied into any promotional contracts or broadcasting contracts. He's a free agent. He's currently in a lawsuit with his former promoter, Bob Arum, top ranked promotions. Um, you know, accusing them of racial bias towards black fighters, etc. Um, the issue is here is that Terence Crawford can't get those fights. Okay, Crawford cannot get those fights at welterweight because all the top welterweights are controlled by Al Heyman. Now, remember, I talked about this. I've been talking about this a lot over the last few weeks. You know, we all get as fans, we all get into this whole. That fight is scared of this fighter, this fight is scared of that fighter, etc, etc, etc. But the bottom line is, I always say, look, if you put two fighters in a room together on their own, they'll probably come out with a contract, you know? But obviously they need the business minds, the experts to help them with all the legalities and draw up the contracts and all that sort of stuff. Their managers, their promoters and stuff like that. And it's, they are the ones that get in the way of fights being made. Because they're looking at it from a business point of view, they're looking at how much money can they take, how much money can they make, etc., etc. Right now, when it comes to, I'm going to just say off the cuff right now, okay? If Spence, I this is look, I'm not saying this is a guaranteed result of what's going to happen, but I believe this is what will happen. If Spence beats Ugas or Ugas beats Spence, Crawford will not be next. I think it will be Keith Thurman. Right. It will probably be Keith Thurman, in my opinion. And the reason I'm saying that is because Al Heyman wants to control everything on that welterweight side of things. 
He's got all the top welterweights. He doesn't need Crawford if he doesn't want, if he doesn't, you know, he doesn't desperately need Crawford to make money. He's got all the top welterweights on his side. He can keep having them do round robins with each other. And not be funny, those fights on the PBC side between the welterweights, they're pretty good fights. They're actually really good fights. They've all been, I don't think I've seen a dull or boring. Maybe the uh, Spence versus Garcia, Mikey Garcia fight, that was probably one. But other than that, I haven't seen any real di disappointing welterweight fights on that side. He can still have those guys keep going around having round robins with each other and block out Terence Crawford alt altogether. Okay, now for some reason, I don't understand why Terence Crawford hasn't signed with Al Heyman and the PBC. Now, I'm not, I'm, listen, all, all promoters are like this. There isn't one promoter who doesn't want to, who doesn't like to keep things in house. They all like to keep things in house. And when you've got that much control over a division, you're going to keep doing it. Now, if Terence Crawford, he's going to want Terence Crawford to sign up to a contract, in my opinion, right? Because he's not going to say, Right, Terence, you come and fight one of my guys as a free agent on a one-fight deal with me. And then guess what? Take all those belts if you win and go and do whatever you want anywhere else. Go and fight on ESPN, go fight on the zone. Do you understand that? He's not going to allow that to happen. Because he's got Thurman who could, who's already ready for as the next potential opponent for Spence or Ugas. And remember, if Ugas was to win that, he can go fight Keith Thurman. Let's say he beats Keith Thurman. He can fight Jerron Aaron Ennis, etc. He can fight Danny Garcia. Do you know what I mean? That's what I'm talking about. You know, Al Heyman's going to put himself in a power. He's put himself in a very powerful position when it comes to the welterweight division. He's got full control of it. So I get where Charlo's coming from in the sense of, you know, Terence Crawford, he may have to, you know, and he needs to handle his business. He may have to take less money. He may have to sign a deal with Al Heyman to make those fights. I, I heard Eddie Hearn, you know, a few weeks ago doing an interview about this. And he turned around and said, look, Terence Crawford is probably going to have to sign up with Al Heyman and the PBC to get those fights. There's no other way around it. And that's what I personally think, you know, Al Heyman's doing. He's holding hostage those belts, those other welterweight belts and those top welterweight names until Terence Crawford comes up and says, show me the contract, I'll sign a deal with you. And it will have to be like a three, four fight deal as well. It won't be just like a one or two fight deal. On the flip side of that, obviously he's, had his, he's having his problems with Bob Arum at the moment. The league, I don't know what's going on with that lawsuit against Bob Arum. Bob, you know, there's Bo Mack as well. You've got to consider Bo Mack's his head trainer, but I believe his manager as well. So, you know, I'm guessing it's Bo Mack doing the deals for him now. You know, who's, who's doing the negotiations for him? I'm guessing that's Bo Mack, you know, and Bo Mack might turn around and say, well, no, we don't want to trap, trap Terence into, a, a, into you know, a three, four, even a five fight contract with you. You know, we want these sort of percentages. We want these sort of guarantees, you know, so the whole business and the politics side of things are getting in the way of this fight being made. The other thing I wanted to say, what I found weird about Jamel Charlo's response was, though, was he said all of that, and I get it, but at the same time, it felt like, it felt like, you know, he was trying to say, stay in your division. Don't come and step into my division. I don't need those sort of problems. That's just what I'm personally thinking here. Like, for me, it would be like, but hey, if you can't get those fights at, you know, at welterweight, cool, step up to me. Let's see what you got. You know, that's what a fighter should be saying. But it sounded like to me there was a lot of nervous energy there in, in the sense that maybe he doesn't want Terence Crawford to step up and, and step into the ring with him. But at the same thing, at the same time, sorry, I meant the same time, you got to look at it this way. OK, if Terence Crawford is having these problems at welterweight, he's going to have those problems at super welterweight as well. Because guess what? Jamel Charlo is a PBC fighter. And the guy, the, the rematch he's having with Castanano, Castanano, is he, he he's a PBC fighter as well, right? So aren't you just going to have the same problems up there? This is what I'm saying. Terence Crawford isn't in a strong position. So, you know, I kind of agree with Jamal Charlo as well. You know, Terence needs to sign with PBC. And I agree with Eddie Hearn as well. You know, Eddie Hearn said this a few weeks ago. He needs to sign with the PBC. He needs to crack a deal with them. If he wants to get that, if he wants to get that work. Now, Terence Crawford doesn't really know Al Heyman, the PBC and stuff like that. 
maybe there's a little bit of nervous energy there from him in terms of the sense of, you know, can I trust this guy? You know, am I going to get screwed here? You know, am I going to get the money that I was, you know, he's used to a certain amount of money he's been getting at top rank. You know, am I still going to get that kind of payday? You know, what's the split going to be like if I if I do get that, if I sign with Al Heyman and I do get the, if I do get the winner of Spence and Ugas, etc. You know, same with Thurman. It's just, it's just a lot of politics in the way, in my opinion. And, and this whole thing's starting to turn into the whole Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather thing again, in my opinion. This whole Terence Crawford, Spence thing is turning into that. I don't think we'll see this fight for years, to be honest with you. And I, I still stand by what I say. I think Thurman's going to get the winner of Uga Spence. You know, I think if Spence loses that fight, I think there'll probably be a rematch. Depending on how close the fight is. And then Thurman next. Uh, I don't think, you know, even though Thurman came out and said, look, I need one tune-up and I'll fight Terence Crawford. I don't think that's going to happen. Like, don't go, don't hold me to that, of course, yeah, because I can't predict the future. I, that's just my feeling of what I think is going to happen. But... Yeah, I, look, I don't see that fight happening anytime soon, you know. So for all us boxing fans who have been craving that fight, you know, dying to see that fight, you know, and don't forget there's other fighters, um, there's other welterweights coming up. So look, look at Jerron en Ennis over there on a the PBC. He can have, even if Ugas, look, he can have Ugas or Spence win that fight, Al Heyman, yeah. If Ugas wins, he can do a round, he can start doing the rounds again. He could fight Thurman, he could th fight Danny Garcia, he could fight, you know, Jerron uh, Ennis. You know, there's there's options for his fighters at welterweight on his own brand, his own company, BBC. You know, he's got all the power and he, he's going to keep doing that until Terence Crawford says, where's the contract? I'll sign it. Where do I sign? You know, that's how I think it's going to play out. I think Terence Crawford, you know, he can't stand off much longer. He's going to have to sign a contract with BBC. I think he's he's, he's in no position to turn around and say, I want that fight, make that fight happen, you know, and we'll we'll do it on a on a fight to fight basis, contract or whatever it is. I don't think that's going to work out that way. I think he, he will have to sign with the PBC. He will have to sign with Al Heyman if he wants Spence, if he wants Ugas, if he wants Thurman, if he wants those top names. Even if he wants Charlo, even if he wants Charlo, he's going to have to go across and sign the contract with PBC and Al Heyman. I don't think he's got any other you know, option, you know, he could fight Virgil Ortiz on his own. He could fight Mikey Garcia because Mikey Garcia is a, uh, um, a free agent, which, you know, which will be another common opponent for him and Spence on the zone. He could fight Mikey Garcia on the zone as well. But then once he fights those two, unless he beats those two, he's back, he's back to square one again. So eventually he's going to have to fight. Uh, he's going to have to sign, sorry, I mean, with Al Heyman and PBC in my personal opinion and it is just my personal opinion looking from the outside in, you know into the whole situation I don't know what goes on behind the scene but that's how it looks like he's gonna have to sign with him you know like I said if he fights Virgil Ortiz and Mikey Garcia on the zone he's back to square one you know he's, he's gonna have the same problems because he can't get those PBC fighters so maybe that's what he needs to do next maybe he needs to fight Virgil Ortiz get him out of the way Get Mike, maybe have another fight at on the zone, get some money, get, you know, Mikey Garcia out of the way or something like that. And then, hey, Al, let's do business. You know, where's the contract? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But, you know, I don't see that, you know, Crawford, Crawford fighting any of those PPC guys for some time. So, what else is going on in the welterweight division? Well, Virgil Ortiz wants Spence fight next. Says it will be the biggest fight in Texas history. Listen, okay. I don't, I don't know if Virgil Ortiz is ready to, you know, to step up to Spence just yet. Look, he's a good fighter. I've enjoyed watching his fights. Uh, you know, hits hard. You know, he, he, he's, he's a talented guy. Is he ready? Don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But if he feels that's the movie he wants to make, that's the movie he wants to make. But at the same time, again, I don't see this happening. You know why it's not going to happen? Because far as I'm, Virgil Ortiz, far as I'm aware, is a Golden Ball fighter right and golden boy have a deal with the zone so again i don't see that fight happening because i don't see al Heyman uh allowing spence to be uh, spence to be broadcasted on the zone yeah he's gonna want to do that on his side with showtime or you know with fox or whatever it is his deals on the other side with his broadcasters 
And the reason I say that is, is because of this news that broke the other day. So Michael Benson here reporting Jamal Charlo versus Jaime Miguel has reportedly fallen through. It's claimed that the fighters agreed terms, but their representatives could not agree over the US broadcaster situation. Once again, it's the same thing. Business politics, etc. getting in the way. Yeah. If they couldn't make this fight, Oscar De La Hoya, Al Heyman, Golden Boy, PBC, DAZN, Showtime or whatever it is. If they could not make this fight happen with Jaime McGear and Jamal Charlo because of the broadcaster situation in the US, then how are they going to make Spence versus... Uh, uh, Virgil Ortiz. Yeah, from what I understand, PBC wanted to have the US uh, pay per view rights and the TV rights and the broadcasting rights, and were offering Golden Boy all the rights in the UK on the zone or something like that, right? So, and the zone weren't having it because obviously, naturally, the PBC want to run it on the on the pay per view platform, but the zone would not be able to justify putting a Jaime Munguia fight. On pay-per-view now remember pay-per-view is dead right <laughs> only joking right but the zone have come out now saying for the big fights like the canelo fights and the aj fights they will have to do that on a pay-per-view platform yeah to pay these fighters to compete with the pbc and the showtime and fox and all those other all those other broadcasters out there okay but and they said they were only going to do it for the big fights the special fights the, the top names like canelo and aj so how are they going to justify that? They can't and they know it. All right. But they still wanted rights to the broadcasting rights. Yeah. But this is where, you know, DAZN's a little bit popular here. A lot more popular here than I'm guessing in the US. I'm not sure. But here in the UK, people have signed up to it. But and they're saying, well, it's popular in the UK to zone. So right now. So you lot have those rights over there and we'll have the ones here in the US. Because if the PBC allow for DAZN to show it on their platform also, or they do a co-promotion in that sense in the US, then the PBC can't charge pay-per-view money. Because that's how the PBC make their money, right? Through pay-per-views. Even though, you know, Jamal Charlo versus Jaime McGeer, in my opinion, is not a pay-per-view fight. That's how PBC want to push it. They're going to push it as a pay-per-view event. But obviously, Oscar De La Hoya and Golden Boy have their deal with DAZN, so will DAZN allow for that? Probably not. So again, this is boxing politics getting in the way. And this is what I'm saying. If this fight couldn't be made, how are you going to make Virgil Ortiz versus Spence? It's not going to happen. So Virgil Ortiz can wish all he wants, but I don't think he's going to get that fight anytime soon. Yeah, look, ter look, at, the, look at the difficulty Terence Crawford's had. It's just not going to happen. So it kind of leads me into this story now, right? So obviously when they announced that they were trying to negotiate Munguia versus Charlo because those guys definitely needed each other in my opinion because Charlo really, I talked about this the other week when I went through record and Charlo's not for anyone at middleweight. He, you know, and Munguia needs a name now. He's at that point where he needs a name. So they need each other. But anyway, when they were talking about the fight potentially happening, some guy turned around and said, if Golden Boy turn it down, how about making the fight with Demetrius Andrade against Charlo? And as you can see, Steven Espinosa turned around and said, been there, done that, Andre turned it down. Now, that tells me there's going to be no attempt at all from Steven Espinosa or Al Heyman to make that fight. Now, that's business politics again, getting in the way, guys. Politics getting in the way again. Okay, Steven Espinosa has issues with Eddie Hearn, etc. And we've heard them go back and forth. And we've heard Eddie Hearn recently make some comments about Steven Espinosa refusing to shake his hand and walk away or something like that. He's got personal between these guys. So I can't see that fight happening either. You know, although that's a fight that should happen in my opinion, it's not going to happen. You know, Charlo's now moving up to 168 against uh, is Zach Parker he's going to be facing. Uh, I think is it for, it's for, um, is it a final elimination fight? I think and then the winner can potentially get Canelo, something along lines of those long, along those lines, or even Benavides. Uh, we're going to get on to Benavides in a minute, but again, business politics get in the way. That fight's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because the the businessmen in charge of these fighters' careers cannot let their egos go and cannot let their personal feelings for each other, which are negative, go either. So again, you know, wishful thinking, but that fight's not going to happen. But let's let's not forget 
right? Stephen Espinosa is making a good point there too, where Charlo did turn down. Uh, sorry, not Charlo. Demetrius Andrade, I mean. Correct me, I'm going to correct myself there. Demetrius Andrade turned down an offer to fight a Charlo, you know, back a few years ago. You know, in the Ring Magazine, I'll link the description, uh, I'll, I'll put the link in the description of the video, of course, for the article. But I'll show you kind of the, um, the headline, the screenshot of the headline. And there it is. Andre pulls out of Charlo fight over money communication issues. So, you know, Andre's done, you know, help, not helped himself in the past either. Let's be honest, Jeb. But look, in, in terms of that fight happening now, Charlo versus Andre, not going to happen. You know, Steven Espinosa has literally just told you in those few short words, that ain't going to happen. That's his way of saying, I ain't doing business with Eddie Hearn. But again, business politics and stuff getting in the way of great fights being made. But again, more personal emotions being shown by these promoters. Look, Hearn on losing Andre Parker first bid, it's absolutely, it, it has absolutely no commercial interest in America. Okay, well, you know what? I'm going to kind of uh, call Eddie's call Eddie out on his bullshit on this one, yeah? Because like we just heard some bullshit from Steven Espinosa as well. So, you know, like I said, all these promoters and managers and broadcasters and stuff like that, they're, they're all the same, right? Okay. But let's let's uh, let's break it down. This whole article here, where Eddie Hearn says it has no commercial man uh, commercial interest in in America, right? So you're telling me that you know Andre versus Luke Keeler, Quigley, is it Akakovov or whatever his name is, Selecki, Liam Will Liam Williams, all had commercial value and interest in America. But a fight against Zach Parker didn't. So all these other names, like I said, Luke Keeler, Quigley, Selecki, Liam Williams did. But the fight against Zach Parker didn't. Like, give me a break. That's just Eddie Hearn showing sour grapes because he lost a purse bid to Frank Warren. Again, personal emotions getting in the way and feelings getting in the way of these fight, these promoters and these businessmen doing business together for what's good for the sport and making great fights. You know what I mean? It, it, they're all at it. All of them, Frank Warren, Eddie Hearn, Oscar De La Hoya, Steven Espinosa, DeZone, Al Heyman, top ranks, uh, Bob Arum. They're all at it. They're all doing this. There's not one of them that you can turn around and say isn't guilty of getting in the way of great fights being made. And it's hurting the sport. Plain and simple. That's the way I see it. Now let's hope this fight can be made, right? This fight right here. There's no reason this fight shouldn't be made. It can't be made. I don't see why it wouldn't be made. Kayla Plant versus David Benavides, right? They've been talking back and forth with each other. You can see their responses to each other. They said a whole lot more than this, I'm sure. Yeah, but just to give you an idea how this all kicked off. Now these guys have been going back and forth with each other for a long, long time, right? Kayla Plant, in my opinion, never made this fight happen because he was waiting on that on that Canelo fight. I spoke about this weeks ago about fighters who are holding on to their belts like Billy Joe Saunders, Callum, uh, Callum Smith, etc. Even Kayla Plant holding on their belts, fighting no ones really, no real big names, you know, protecting their belts so so they could get that big bag and that big money fight against Canelo. All right. Now Kayla Plant's been beaten. There's no reason why. He shouldn't fight David Benavides. They are on the same, they're under the same promotional banner. So there's no reason, in terms of a business point of view, there's no reason why this fight shouldn't be shouldn't be made. Okay? But I've always felt Kayla Plant has, in my personal opinion, has avoided this fight. I'm gonna say it. Kayla Plant's a really good boxer, really talented fighter. I'm not knocking him or anything like that, yeah. But I just feel like he's never fancied it. And some of, especially with some of the personal stuff that's been said between these two, you would think he would want to wanted to get into ring with him by now. So, look, they're both saying they're up for it. Let's hope it happens. You know, I would love to see that fight. Obviously, you know, David Benavides has to fight David Lemieux first because he's in, you know, that contract signed. If he beats David Lemieux, then yeah, there's no reason why this fight can't happen. You know, and they're and they're potentially saying in September of this year. There's no re the only reason it would be is because one of the fighters is causing an issue. And from what I've seen over the years, I personally think it's Caleb Plot. That's just my take on it. But hopefully, you know, this fight can be made. But 
at the same time again this is boxing this is modern day boxing like i said business and politics always gets in the way i think i've proven that with all the other uh, potential fights and uh, things that i've talked about already today here on the podcast but we'll have to wait and see but i think it's a great fight i would love to see it no doubt about it um but again i'm not gonna this is why i don't get excited so much about the sport this is why i don't get so excited anymore because you know what the fights we want to see aren't getting made don't get me wrong we get like, i'm not gonna say we haven't had any good fights over the last couple of years we have of course we have but then this we want to see more we want to see these guys go at each other we want to see some of these guys go with, against each other these are some of the top fights in the sport and we're not seeing that action you know why because the businessmen and the politics and the promoters and the managers and the broadcasters are getting in the way of these fights being made in my personal opinion that's how i see it you could blame the fighters as much as you want you can run with that whole he's scared of him and he's scared of him and la 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 as much as you want yeah personally that's the way i see it uh, it's the business men and women of this sport that are getting in the way of great fights being made now let's get into these heavyweights right so look <laughs> Right, this guy put a tweet out I caught, I caught wind of on Twitter and he said the most pathetic stance in boxing is Fury's proved it, one defence. Right, so look, Tommy Fury uh, made a comment saying that on the back of Tyson Fury say he might retire after the Dillian White, Dillian White fight, he's got nothing left to prove, you know, and you know, Tommy Fury agreed with his brother, etc. Of course he would, you know, it's his brother at the end of the day. But my answer to that is BS absolute rubbish yeah the fact that listen yeah he beat Klitschko he was the first guy to do it went to Germany outboxed him outclassed him you know great win right then on top of that you know he, he had his little hyenas or whatever you want to call it due to his personal problems and then came back fought De uh, Deontay Wilder three times beat him three times battered him in you know the last two fights you know the last fight was you know, was epic, no doubt about it, in my opinion. I thought it was a great fight. You know, it wasn't a great boxing fight. It was a great brawl between two guys just determined to do, you know, to, to beat each other. But to say that's it, he's done, he's, he's cemented his legacy. No, because he's still got to fight, AJ. He's still got to fight, Usyk. He's going to fight. If he beats Dillian White, that's another name to his his record, great. But he's still got to fight, AJ. He's still got to fight, Usyk. You know, there's other names out there like Joey jo uh, Joe Joyce, you know. He won't fight Parker because fight Parker's his little bum chum. All right, so if you're telling me that that's enough for him to cement his legacy of one of the greatest heavyweights of all time, the answer is no. Clear out your division, then retire. Simple as that. I'm not going to have all this, you know, your Fury fans jumping on here telling me, oh no, what are you talking about? He doesn't need those other fights. He could do it right now. Bullshit. I'm calling you on your bullshit. Stop it. If that's what you're saying, all it takes to be, rem to be remembered as a great heavyweight or one of the greatest heavyweights of all times, no. Go look at some of the great names. Look at Lennox Lewis, great name, great record. Yeah, Ali and all those people. If you want to be up there with those sort of guys, you're gonna have to do a lot more than what what you're what you've got on paper already. Yeah, one defense of your title as well. You're about to have the second defense. Okay. He needs to he needs to fight the AJs and the U6s, even the, even Joe Joyce, in my opinion. You know, there's other names out there for him to click still to still take on, providing he gets past Dillian White, of course. And that's going to be a tough fight in itself. Dillian's, you know, he's not going to be no he's not going to be some walkover, in my opinion. You know, he's going to bring it to Tyson, so that could be a tough fight as well. He could lose that fight. Yeah, Dillian's a good heavyweight. You know, and I've said a lot of bad things about, you know, I've said a lot of things about Dillian in the past, yeah? And I still stand by those things when it comes to Dillian White. But again, to turn around and say that he's going to retire after this fight and that's it, he doesn't, he's got nothing left to prove. Give me a break, you know, do me a favour. Give me a break. Seriously, I'm tired of all these narratives. You know what I can't believe? That AJ has gone and give Ukraine all the heavyweight belt back after all my hard work of relieving them. You big useless dosser. You've let a little steroid ban come up from middleweight and set about you and take all your belts. But it's going to have to take a real British Lancaster bomber like me to go and relieve the useless little steadhead of the belts and get them back to Britain. You useless dossers. Honestly, bring them to me.
The Wajitsi King, bring him to me. And I'll put him in the place. I'll relieve him on the belts again. Now, this is something I wanted to touch on a few weeks ago, but I totally forgot about it, right? So, how can Tyson Fury accuse someone else of PED, a PED abuse, right? Taking PEDs. When this guy himself has taken and been caught for using PEDs before the Klitschko fight. And you know what? Klitsch Klitschko came to the defense of Alexander Usyk, yeah, by saying this to Tyson Fury. You live, Tyson Fury, you live in a glass house and someone needs to take away your stones. Wasn't long ago before our fight where you actually tested positive. Anyone can Google it. Keep it classy. And I totally agree with Klitschko here. They're like Tyson Fury needs to be careful what he throws out there. Because the simple fact of the matter is he, he is a PD cheat himself. Yeah, he got caught cheating. Let's get that right. Before he had his little episode, his mental health issue thing, I think that's what contributed to his mental health issue is that he got caught cheating of, you know, after winning his greatest victory, which was, which was Vladimir Klitschko dethroning him. And he should have got all this accolade and all this, you know, um, all this praise for that. And he didn't. You know, there's other reasons as well, because he's very outspoken and stuff like that. And he said certain things that he probably shouldn't have said out in public. His personal views is on, on, view, on views on things. But at the same time, when you've been caught using PEDs yourself, who are you to go around accusing other fighters of using PEDs? Let's be real. Yeah. So Tyson Fury, you need to check yourself, mate. Yeah. Before you, you know before you go around accusing other people of, you know, using drugs, using PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, yeah? Because you've done it yourself. Right, let's move on to this man right here, Anthony Joshua, right? So now we all know that Alexander Usyk has gone back home to the Ukraine to help defend his country against Russia uh, with the conflict between Russia and Ukraine that's going on right now. I'm not gonna go too deep into that. I went pretty deep into that last week. Um, I'm sure that upset a few people, but anyway, that's my opinion on the whole situation. But anyway, um, let's get into this, right? Which is Anthony Joshua now at the moment. We know obviously Alexander Usyk isn't going to be able to have that fight with Anthony Joshua, the rematch anytime soon. That, you know, a lot of people are hoping next year that fight will happen. It may not. You know, it depends how far, you know, this whole situation goes. And even if that is the case, let's let's say you, Ukraine win that situation with Russia and you think Alexander Usyk's not going to stay at home helping his countrymen and women uh, rebuild U Ukraine. You know, I don't see that fight happening if the fight ever, ever happens at all. You know, personally, I don't see, you know, it, it may be 2024 before we see that fight happening for, you know. Yeah, so that fight may not happen. However, okay, in the meantime, they are potentially looking at interim fights for Anthony Joshua, right? Now, he says he doesn't want easy walkover fights. He wants, you know, top top names, top opponents, right? And these are some of the guys that, you know, they're, they're looking at. So this is what Team Ortiz had to say. Lewis King Ortiz would love an opportunity to step up to the challenge of facing Joshua. Ortiz manager Jimine uh, Jay Jimenez told Sky Sports. Otto Wilden posted on Twitter, I'm by far the best option here. Wilder is coming off back-to-back -back losses to, against Fury that I took the distance and sent to the hospital to get 47 stitches. Ortiz got dropped twice by Charles Martin that Joshua wiped out in two rounds. I think Joe Joyce could give AJ a good fight, but he's nothing like Usyk. The only reason Joshua wouldn't pick me as an opponent is because they know I'm a big threat and I'll, I'll hand him his third loss. Wow, okay. It's a, you know, definitely a fight that I've always been interested in. It's a big fight and a big domestic dust up and I'm, I'm here and I'm ready. If he wants it, I'll give it him. Sign the contract. So you, you just heard there from Joy, Joy, Joe Joyce himself what he thought and this is what he tweeted. Two GB lines in an all British heavyweight showdown. This fight will be massive. I'm highly ranked and undefeated. Let's get it. 
I think the best options there are definitely Joe Joyce. In my opinion, out of all of those, I would like to see the Joe Joyce fight, yeah? Okay, Otto Weiland next, and then Luis Ortiz. Now, the reason I'm saying Luis Ortiz right at the end is because Luis Ortiz, in my opinion, isn't the same guy after fighting Wilder twice and getting KO'd by Wilder twice, yeah? I think he's been essentially past his best now. Um, you know, I could be wrong, but I'm just going with that, right? Maybe a few years ago, definitely I wanted to see that fight. You know, but now you want to fight Luis Ortiz now? Like, you didn't want to take him when he was at his best. So, I don't agree with that fight being made at all. And I've talked about this in the past. Okay. But also, while in fight, he seems hungry. Joe Joyce, he seems hungry and wants to bring it to AJ. They, they both feel confident they can win that fight. Those are pretty good fights. So, either one of those two, cool. But however, this was put out here recently. And I don't think this fight is going to happen. But this wasn't put out there by Anthony Joshua. And but Anthony Joshua, I think he named Joe Joyce he, in an interview behind the gloves or something like that. He even talked about Otto Wallin. I think he might even he mentioned Luis Ortiz. I've not heard Anthony Joshua say this out public. If I'm wrong, leave me a comment. Put the link in the description in, in the comment section. Uh, but I've not seen it myself personally. But this came from Eddie Hearn. Now Eddie Hearn put out there that I think Joshua's top choice to face in an interim fight is Wilder, Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder, who's come off three losses, well, three fights against uh, um, Tyson Fury. The first fight was obviously a draw. Some people say that was controversial. Okay, cool. Uh, the second fight, he got battered. His, his team threw in the towel. Even though people want to accuse him of quitting, he didn't quit. Let's be real. His team threw in the towel. Yeah, but of course, people are going to absolutely hate the guy. They're going to push that narrative. That's cool. Do your thing. Um, and I've had some of, them come on, some of them come on my channel, channel and put that stuff out there. Okay, but at the same time, he got had a hard, tough fight in that third fight, went 11 rounds, got battered in that round as well. But he gave as good as he got, he gave as good as he could against Tyson Fury. You know, it was an exciting fight, it was an epic fight. They both pushed themselves to the limit in that fight. Um, you know, like I said, it wasn't really a box, it wasn't really a boxing fight, it was more of a brawl between these two guys. It was against like the street fighting, brawling type of Wilder against Tyson Fury, the street fighter who can actually box. You know, that kind of situation. Uh, and it was, it was it was enjoyable to watch. You know, a lot of people, you know, were shooting it down when that fight got made, you know. But I don't see, you know, at, at the end of the day, it was a hell of an entertaining fight. Period. But, and Wilder's come out recently saying he's going to take a year off. He feels bitter towards the sport and all this sort of stuff that he spoke about. Uh, saying he wants to go on a uh, tour or something like that. And do psychedelics. Or is it psychedelics they call it? Both, whatever it, whatever they are. He wants to do that and take a year out. He's talking about, I think he's talking about getting into music and stuff like that. So I don't know whether Deontay Wilder's heart's in the sport anymore. Yeah, he still says he loves the sport, whether he actually wants to be in the sport, an active fighter anymore. Who knows? We'll find out in a year from now, I think. But that fight's not going to happen now. So Eddie Hearn putting that out there, like, I don't see that fight happening at all a anytime soon. I think Wilder's going to take some time. Personally, you know, right now it sounds like he's in that mindset that he doesn't want to come back. So, again, that's not going to happen. Um, but, yeah, I think the best options for AJ right now, definitely, I like the Joe Joyce fight a lot. I like that fight a hell of a lot. I think, you know, he's a top contender. You know, why not? Let's make it. You know, he's got great, strong amateur background, tough, durable, you know, brings a fight to AJ, will push AJ hard as well. Why not? Let's see that fight, you know. But if not, I'll, I'll be happy with the Otto Weiland fight. If they make the Lewis Ortiz fight, you know, I'm not going to say I'll be overly disappointed. I just don't think it's going to be the best version of, of Lewis Ortiz. I think, I think he's past his best version, you know, especially after those two back-to-back -back losses to uh, Deontay Wilder. Whether it's worth making that fight now, who knows? Look, maybe I'm overlooking, maybe I'm looking into it too much. Maybe Lewis Ortiz still, still can bring it, who knows? But I just, I personally think he's probably past his best now. And I think the best fight out of all those fights is for me, Joe Joyce, by Anthony Joshua, uh, but then um, the Otto Wilder fight, you know, might be a good one as well. Pretty good name there, you know. He likes to bring it too. You, you know, we saw what you get what he what he was able to do against Fury. Um, but remember, that's probably the like the only literary fight I've seen of Wilder. I'm not going to lie. So I, I don't know what he's been like in his other performances, but we'll have to just wait and see. Okay, and I'm going to finish it off with AJ because some stuff came out again. Stuff that I talked about years ago, like I've proved like the whole AJ Wilder negotiation situation. My mindset has never changed with that and it never will. Yeah. Okay. Unless something else comes out that blatantly points out that one of these guys was at fault. Right. I did. A, I've got a whole playlist dedicated to it. Go through that playlist. The receipts are in there. 
okay but this came out recently on a tweet where AJ replied to a fan on Twitter so someone accused AJ saying to him that you got scared from Wilder and AJ replied saying need I say more let's put this AJ duck saga uh, duck saga to rest I respect Wilder he's a good fighter he just wasn't ready to, to fight me if you if you don't believe me see below and this is what he he added to that tweet in his reply now this is what Wilder said like when this whole thing with Tyson Fury was going on for the third fight and you know Tyson Fury you know they were trying to get out of that fight with Wilder said they can move on and make the fight with AJ and all that stuff Deontay Wilder put this tweet out and he said something in a video as well so here it is when that fight was was a draw I told you that I would give you a rematch you know I was offered more money to fight for fight to fight Joshua than I was getting to fight you again being a man of my word I fought you okay so he's referring to the DAZN deal, right? Now, in the li in the description of this podcast, you will find all the links, yeah? Okay. Now, he's referring to the DAZN deal, the $120 million DAZN deal, right? The one that did not include AJ in there, right? Now, they, they were offering him a four-fight deal, right? One of them would have been against Dominic Brazil, I think. I think they were going to be in another fight. That one might be in the second one against Ortiz or whatever it was. Uh... And then two, they were potentially talking about two fights against AJ. But the problem was they couldn't guarantee AJ in the contract, which is what Deontay Wilder wanted. Okay? They couldn't guarantee it. Yeah, even the the chief executive officer of the zone, which was John Skipper, I think he he was at the time, I don't know if he is now, even he admitted that they that they had screwed up the negotiations and the deal with Deontay Wilder. And he took the full responsibility for it. Okay. Now, I'm going to read off the Boxing Scene article. There were loads of articles around this. Suddenly, some of those articles have disappeared. It's really weird. But the Boxing Scene one is still there. And this is... I'm going to read you some of the quotes. And I'll start with Wilder. And this is what Wilder said. I didn't take the DAZN deal because the people that were representing DAZN were coming with an offer that wasn't upfront and truthful with me. Okay? They came back and apologized to us. They knew they were in the wrong. The money is not going to be the motivator of of everything i bet on myself i make way more money than what they were offering anyway they were not honest in the information that what that was going in the office and who's getting what i felt that they hesitated to give us a response they didn't want to reveal the information and that was and that was a very important information that we needed to make a decision so this is what skipper said in reply okay john skipper in an interview last month with Lance Pugmire of the, of the Athletic, the Zone Executive Chairman John Skipper commented, commented on the Wilder negotiations, saying, In retrospect, I was too brash going in, in there without creating a relationship I needed to create with the people who advised Deontay Wilder. I have now worked to do that. It has to do with going back to the education I need before going into boxing. When we left that wild meeting, I knew we'd messed up and that we were going, we were not going to be successful. We were impatient and after having some early success, we wanted to move quickly. Now I understand that I've got to work relationships, work within a framework and understand other people's self-interest and needs as well. If I had to, to do it again, I would have gone in and said, I'm playing the long game. I'm playing the long game with Canelo and Triple G too. So openly admitting, John Skipper, openly admitting. And remember, I'm going to provide you with some evidence too, because let's not forget AJ turned down 50 million. I'm going to give you that evidence in a minute, all right? But openly admitting John Skipper there that they, he screwed up the deal, right? Okay, he didn't deny that, you know, he didn't deny that one bit. He didn't come out and say, whoa, 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 you know, we weren't dishonest, we weren't truthful, we weren't... He didn't do any of that. Yeah, he literally turned around and said, hey, our fault, we messed up, you know, we should have done better. We were too impatient. We were trying to push it and make it happen quick. And really, we should have taken our time with it. But also notice how he didn't counter anything Deontay Wilder said by saying that, oh, you know, Wilder's telling lies there, you know, hey, you know, we weren't, we were totally honest and truthful with you. You know, they couldn't even guarantee the AJ fight. AJ's not a disowned fighter. A lot of people think he is. Yeah. AJ has been having a fight to fight contract with DAZN right over where his fights are being shown in the US and I'm guessing that his fights are going to be shown here in, in the UK eventually as well 
it's going to happen. Sky Sports are probably going to lose that and they're going to run pay-per-view here in the UK on the zone for AJ fights. Okay? But he's not a design fighter. So who are they to negotiate Anthony Joshua versus Deontay Wilder? They can't even guarantee him. So you could turn around and say all that stuff about what Wilder said there and use that to, you know, your narrative or whatever. But to turn, to turn around AJ now trying to run away. And I remember when he said that afterwards, he was called out for it, Deontay Wilder. And I remember, I think he was it on 78 Sport because that guy gets all the exclusive interviews. He's the only one that does get exclusive interviews with Deontay Wilder. So you have to watch his channel to get that, to get that content. But even he said that, he goes, man, what's he talking about? He goes, oh, you know what I'm referring to? It was the DAZN deal. Yeah, when I said Joshua fight, I meant the DAZN deal. I turned that down to fight Fury. To give a, to give Fury a rematch. Right? And remember, Fury was running off and making his ESPN deal at the time with top-ranked Bob Arum in, the, in America. So that's what he's referring to. And there you have it. John Skipper openly admitted, we cocked up. It was our fault. So when he's referring to the Joshua fight, he's talking about the DAZN deal. The same DAZN deal where DAZN, John, Chief exec Executive Officer of DAZN, could not guarantee Anthony Joshua into the contract. He couldn't even, he, and because he couldn't do that, he couldn't tell Deontay Wilder's team what the split was going to be about, how much was AJ getting, how much would Deontay get, how would it all work out, how would it all break down, they couldn't do any of that. Even John Skipper himself admit, has admitted they were not prepared for that meeting. So stop it. Listen to what's been said. John Skipper said we were not prepared for that meeting. And the reason they weren't prepared for that meeting, guess what? Because they couldn't guarantee AJ. They couldn't reveal the numbers that they were going to offer AJ and what the split was going to be and all that other important stuff that every fighter and every team of every fighter wants to know. That's boxing business right there, guys. Yeah, simple as that. But, however, I am going to go into some other points which everyone conveniently has forgotten. Let's not forget, Anthony Joshua openly admitted that he turned down the $50 million offer that was originally presented to Anthony Joshua up after he said, Wilder's team, bring me 50 million and I'll take the fight. It's the first time that I've really had issues on the financial side of a fighter. So let's say for instance, that 50 million we spoke about, listen, it's a hell of a lot of money and it was an honor to even have that number thrown at me. But then when you dissected it and what it was, it was just kind of like a, a rights fee. We own you um, for, this, for this amount of money. But the issue that I had is I've got long-standing contracts in places with certain partnerships. So you may put that money forward and think you can own me 100%, but you may only own 50%. So that makes their 50 worth 25. So when you start getting into the intricacies of a contract and what the real value is, then that, that starts taking place. So that's what I'm saying. The 50 was unbelievable. It's a great number and so on. But there are things in place that don't make that 50 worth the 50 to the person paying it. That's what I'm saying, the, the real, like looking at the, I haven't seen a, a bank statement or it wasn't in an escrow account, so I didn't see that to be fair. But I'm sure that the people, that America's a big place and there's a lot of wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people that would be interested in backing a fight. It's my point, right, where everyone was talking about the whole, hey, they ain't got the money, blah, blah, blah. There's no way PBC could come up with that money, even though they managed Floyd Mayweather's career for so many years. Uh, Steven Espinosa also had a you know ma massive part he played in that from a Showtime point of view where they gave Floyd Mayweather certain guarantees. Let's not forget recently uh, the Canelo negotiations. So where Canelo was deciding whether he was going to go with PBC and Showtime or whether he was going to go with the Zone this year for his next two fights, he obviously chose the Zone. However, the PBC the, and listen, the Zone themselves. Yeah, let's put it this way, right? The Zones themselves. All right, have turned around and I've got the clip. I'm going to play the clip of Eddie Hearn saying this, right? Where Eddie Hearn talks about this. The zone themselves said that they have to start doing pay per views because they have to be able to comp compete with PBC, with Fox, with Showtime, etc. Because that's the only way they can guarantee big money for fighters like Canelo and Anthony Joshua, right? So that means clearly Showtime and the PBC and Fox, if you want to throw in there, have plenty of money they can throw at fighters. They can bring up that money if they want to. That's the proof. Look into what's being said here, guys. Listen to what's being said. Okay? Right? I'm going to play you that clip in a minute. But listen to what AJ said. 
right? AJ just literally said, look, that offer was great. But guess what? I couldn't take it for this reason, that reason, whatever his reasons were. Okay? But he turned around and said, the offer was there. Okay? But like I said, this is the point I'm trying to make. Where people were saying the money wasn't there, they didn't have the money. Of course they had the money. Are you having a laugh? You don't think they could get investors in America to invest in that in such a big fight? And like I just explained to you a minute ago, all right? How the hell, if they don't have that kind of money and they're supposed to be broke and they can't drum up that sort of money, how do they offer, how do they offer Canela Alvarez more money than the zone did? And Canela Alvarez turned around and said he took the zone deal because he felt the Bivol fight and the Triple G fight were the best fights for him next. All right. But they offered like 100 or 110 million to Canelo recently to have a two fight deal on Showtime with Al Heyman and the PBC. Where did they get that money from then? So clearly they can get that 50 million together for Anthony Joshua. Stop it. Stop all the nonsense. Let's let's listen to Eddie Hearn. Yeah. Because yesterday's price is not uh, today's price with Canelo Alvarez. And, you know, his star power has risen so greatly that the only way that you can compete with the offers coming in from Fox and Showtime is to use the pay-per-view model. So it's a one-off for their platform. They're still providing incredible value as a subscription service and that's what they are. They're not looking to do loads of pay-per-view events like everybody else, but also understand that for Canelo Alvarez or for Joshua against Usyk or those just one-off fights, they will have to have that functionality to compete with those numbers. They will have to have that functionality to compete with those numbers. The numbers of the PBC, Showtime and Fox. So there you go, man. That's proof that Showtime, Fox, Al Heyman can generate big money for big money fights. And they could have easily generated that 50 million for Anthony Joshua. And he admitted it as well. So stop the nonsense, guys. Yeah. Like I didn't, I, you know, I didn't really want to get back into the whole AJ Wilder negotiation situation. But when I saw this the other day, I thought, you know what? Like, yeah, I'm not having that. Like, come on, yeah. The narratives that people are still pushing are unbelievable, right? Okay. And I think again, once again, like I have done in the past, I've proven it and I've backed it with evidence. Yeah, a lot of people will come on here and say you haven't proven Jack, blah blah blah, and push their narratives. That's cool. I still have some of those guys who back then, I think they keep an eye on my channel, they like to jump back on it. And you know, the AJ fanboys, the Eddie Hearn fanboys. But the fact is, the money was there. PBC, Showtime, Fox, whoever could, could easily drum up that money. And it was Showtime back then who was offering that 50 million. They've proven that. They just recently offered Canelo a $100 million deal, Showtime and Al Heyman, PBC. So stop the nonsense, guys. Yeah, I'm tired of it. Get over it. The fact is, 50 million was put on the plate. AJ turned it down. Jo yeah, Deontay Wilder might have said the Joshua fight, but what he was referring to was the zone deal, which they couldn't guarantee. And John Skipper had, had, has admitted that. So that's the end of that debate, in my opinion. Last bit of news, the last topic here is Catrell defeat referred to police. I have to question why the judges got it so wrong. I have already sent a letter to the police, Sir Lindsay Hole. Jack Catrell's PM, um, sorry, MP in Corley told Sports Mail. Now, apparently, the police have got involved in this investigation into it, it's into the judging of Josh Taylor versus Jack Catrell, like they haven't got better things to do with themselves, you know, out there on the streets right now. But they got involved in this as a, I think, I'm guessing as a criminal investigation. I have no idea. But the British Boxing Border Control have replied and put out their decision regarding the whole situation, right? And this is what they had to say. Following an internal review of the scoring for, of the Josh Taylor versus Jack Catchall contest by, by all three appointed judges, the stewards of the board decided to call Mr. Ian John Lewis to appear before them to explain his returned card. Having considered, considered Mr. Ian John Lewis Lewis's ex explanation, the stewards of the board decided to downgrade Mr. John Lewis from an A-star class to a class official. Whilst the board were satisfied with Mr. John Lewis's scorecard, did not affect the overall result of the contest, the stewards of the board did have issues with his margins. As the re regulatory body for the sports in Great sport in Great Britain, the British Boxing Board of Control continue to improve and maintain the high quality of consistency in scoring by 
by our licensed officials. As such, the stewards of the board have further decided that in addition to each ACE star class official being evaluated after each bout, as per current procedure, they will now also be subjected to a separate individual annual review. Finally, the British Boxing Board of Control have contacted the WBO, WBC, IBF and WBA, supporting Jack Cattrall to be made a mandatory challenger for each or all championship sanction, sanctioning bodies. Here's the bit that bothers me with this, right? This bit right here. Whilst the board were satisfied that Mr. John Lewis, John Lewis's scorecard did not affect the overall result of the contest, the stewards of the board did have issue with his margins. So didn't that affect the result? Like, I can't remember the scorecards, but like, listen, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about, right? So you're clearly saying that you had a problem with his margin. So that you're basically saying that, guess what? You didn't score the fight right. Right? That's basically what I'm saying. He did not score the fight correctly. Like, but, but yet we don't believe that his poor judging and his poor scorecard, which didn't reflect the truth of what was going on in the ring, did not affect the end result. Really? Like, you're serious? And now they've only knocked him down. They've knocked him down for, what is it? They said an A class to a class official. That's going to hurt his pocket, isn't it? It's going to hurt him. See, that's the problem with boxing. British boxing, anyway. We, we have the worst judging in the world. We know that. We're, we're notorious for it. Okay? But the bottom line is, this isn't enough. Jack Cattrall has lost out on becoming the undisputed champion of the world. Jack Cattrall will probably never ever get a shot in the way the boxing world works right now in terms of politics and business, in terms of the sport, promoters, managers, I've been banging on about it for about an hour now, yeah? Jack Cattrall, because of that reason, Jack Cattrall may, will probably never ever get a shot at Undisputed again. He may get a world title shot, but never a shot at Undisputed again like that, you know? And to put on such a great performance like he did, and I, I gave you my scorecard, to that fight last time around when I did the Fight Night Rewind, I'll put it on the end screen annotations or something like that. So if you want to watch that, you can. But the simple fact of the matter, yeah, okay, is Jack Cattrall has been screwed and no one's been punished for it. And if you call that a punishment, you need to seriously open your eyes. Plain and simple. Yeah, feel for the guy, but look, that's what their decision is. That's how you, come on, they were never going to admit fault. They were never going to tell us come out publicly and said their official was completely wrong they're just not going to do it it never happens in the sport and that's it that's the end of it you know no criminal investigation is going to like lead it like how what are they going to do what are the police are going to do like the police are going to go away and learn now how to score fights and then what turn around and say hey you didn't score that fight properly we're sticking you in prison or you're going to court and you've got to pay a massive fine or whatever it is compensation to come on what's going to happen nothing it's done it's finished like the police ain't got better things to do with the time anyway all right let's be real but it was down to the british boxing border control to take some serious action and they didn't so disappointing to see but that's that's boxing for you like i said like triple g says big drama sure all right listen i've got nothing else to really add to today's podcast no other real stories uh gonna just quick throw this one in cheekily right look at this guy Someone tell me what has happened to Billy Joe Saunders. Jesus, how much weight has he put on? Talk about who ate all the pies. Like, you're telling me that guy's coming back to boxing? I mean, he's living off that Canelo payday, I'm telling you now. He is living off that Canelo payday right now. Like, he might come back for that Chris Eubank Jr. fight for right now, but, yo, I, I think, yo, Billy Joe, Joe Saunders is definitely done. Especially, you know, he quit against Canelo, and I think he's got his payday. Never really fought any other top opponents apart from Canelo. Got his payday, he's done. But wow, look at the size of him. Jeez. Oh, and I did promise you a funny version of the AJ turning down the 50 million offer, yeah? Got to put that in earlier on. Here it is for you. I'll take 50 million up front. If that's the case, Wilder's team, bring me 50 million up front and we'll take the fight several days later. So let's say for instance that 50 million we spoke about, listen it's a hell of a lot of money and it was an honour to even have that number thrown at me. But the issue that I had is I've got long-standing contracts in places with certain partnerships. So when you start getting into the intricacies of a contract and what the real value is, 
then that, that starts taking place. So that's what I'm saying, the 50 was unbelievable, it's a great number. Okay, and with that note, as always, like, share and subscribe. Until next time, this is Cyphebox reminding you to keep it real. I was gonna rip his heart out, I'm the best ever I'm the most brutal and vicious and most ruthless champion that's ever been There's no one can stop me, Lynx is a conqueror No, I'm Alexander, he's no Alexander I'm the best ever, there's never been anybody ruthless I'm Sonny Liston, I'm Jack Dempsey, there's no one like me I'm from their club, there's no one that can match me My style is impetuous, my defense is impregnable And I'm just ferocious, I want your heart, I wanna eat his children Praise be to Allah